Hey everyone, welcome to Discorched Online. Hope you're enjoying your Saturday and uh, thank you for joining me again today. I want to start out by, of course, talking about what we'll be talking about and showing you. Uh, so we'll be talking about Chablis, uh, one of my favorite wine regions and uh, favorite wines to drink. Uh, tonight I'm drinking the 2013 Pascal Bouchard Premier Cru Chablis from the Fourcham Vineyard, which is right here. We'll go a little bit over this bottle label uh, a little further, but that's what I have in my glass here, and it is quite tasty, if I might say so myself. Um, I want to start out with a really obvious fact, but also potentially a controversial one. Uh, the only grape that they grow in Chablis is Chardonnay, and if you are someone who doesn't like Chardonnay, I think that's unfortunate. Um, Chardonnay is one of these varieties that is incredibly versatile it can be used to make wines in a whole bunch of different styles. You can have everything from this side of, Chablis, of Chardonnay, as in the Chablis, which we'll get to with its kind of really lean, racy, uh, minerally profile, to something diametrically opposed, something really rich, creamy, buttery, loaded with tropical fruit, as you might find in some classic Chardonnays from California or Australia some other places. And Chardonnay can do just about everything in between. And that's not even really mentioning its pivotal role in producing sparkling wine. And so to me, when someone, unless someone just does not like white wine in the first place, if someone says to me, oh, I don't like Chablis, or I'm sorry, I don't like Chardonnay, I just feel like, well, you probably just haven't tried enough different expressions. You may have, may have had more likely a sort of big, rich, fruit forward and, and really kind of buttery style that you didn't like, fair. Uh, more less frequently, maybe you've had a style of, Ch of Chardonnay like this Chablis and you don't like that style of wine, but Chardonnay is such a diverse category and, and I'm sure I'll come back to it in the weeks to come, maybe on another side of the, of the spectrum, that uh, it is really one of these things where saying you don't like Chardonnay if you like white wine is sort of unnecessarily cutting out a lot of the great wines of the world, including Chablis. So we're going to start by kind of orienting ourselves. We're in the northern, northeastern part of France. Uh, if you think about where Paris is, you kind of go essentially east from Paris. Uh, it's about, um, my sense of the, of the distance isn't great. It's probably a, an hour and a half, two hour drive, whatever that means in France. Uh, and you are in Chablis. And Chablis is kind of a fascinating place. It's, it's like Champagne, which is, which is reasonably close to in that it is cold, it is relatively exposed, um, and it's not, you know, it's not super suitable for doing much else besides making wine uh, from a from an agricultural standpoint, from what I understand. And a big part of the reason for that is it has this really do one dominant soil type called uh, Kimmeridgian limestone. And for for those, that's not going to be a history lesson, but or a geology lesson, I should say, but uh, limestone is mostly comprised of ancient marine fossils and sediment that combine uh, over millions of years. It's chalk, basically, so very starkly white. Uh, it's very high in calcium carbonate, and it's extremely porous, and it's extremely poor. It's very low in nutrients. And these are really actually great things for producing wine generally and producing this style of Chardonnay in particular, because we're in a part of France that is quite rainy, and so that the porous nature of the soil means that the rain that falls doesn't linger by the roots, causing issues for the grapes and for the vine, but instead drains relatively quickly. And there's this fascinating sort of inverse relationship between the chemical composition of soil and the chemical composition of wine that's made from it. And I'm not going to get too far into that other than to just make this observation, which is, so again, not to go too far down our, our middle school or high school chemistry lessons, but if we think about a pH scale, so things that are higher in pH or are more basic are things like calcium carbonate, like limestone. And wine, on the other hand, is generally quite acidic, ranges depending on, you know, kind of the wine and where it's made and all that. But wine is, is on the acidic side. And, and generally speaking, that's a positive thing for wine. You can certainly have wine that's too acidic, but, but wine that's not acidic enough can be unfortunately quite unpleasant uh, in a sort of lacking structure sense. And so there's this interesting inverse relationship that has to do with how vines extract minerals and other nutrients from soil, where if you plant a vine in a soil that's quite high in pH, like limestone, the, the vine actually has to produce more 
natural acids to break down the structure of the of the uh, soil to extract those nutrients and minerals. And as a result, it means not just the vine, but the grapes that grow on it are higher in acid. And so that's why in many places, uh, limestone is seen as the premium soil or one of the premium soil types for white wine, Chardonnay specifically, but also Sauvignon Blanc, um, as in Sancerre, which is a part of the same broad um, sort of ridge uh, or vein of limestone and in other parts of the world as well. Anyhow, uh, all of that to say, Chablis to me is also one of these wines where we very quickly come across this, this very difficult to resolve issue with wine. And, and I'm not going to dwell on it too much other than to say that Chablis provokes in most people, most trained tasters, a sense of this. It's one of the first things you learn about when you're learning about wine as this this idea that wines can convey a sense of place, terroir, if you want to use the French term, and that really the soil that the wine is grown in is in some way something you can actually kind of capture in, in the wine, i.e. the wine has a sort of chalky character to it. And when I was learning about wine and when many people were learning about wine and, and to this day still, a lot of people are sort of learn and that, that that's because it grows in chalk soil and makes a lot of sense. Except the science is actually pretty clear that that doesn't really happen. We're still not really sure why it is that there's a sort of detectable chalky character in most Chablis. Some there's some argument that it has to do with winemaking technique more than the the actual soil. I'm not going to delve into that too much, but it is a really fascinating conversation that's that's going on in the world of wine from the winemaking side, the sort of scientific and analytic side, and certainly from the sommelier and wine professional side where we're trying to wrap our heads around this idea of, okay, well, we taste these things, we smell these things in wine. What from a chemical and biologic perspective actually is responsible for that? And is it something that we can kind of verify scientifically or is it this sort of thing that we maybe are more I'm not telling ourselves it's there because I think it really is there, but we're not yet sure why. And we're not sure if it's something that really has to do with the specific place or if it's a little bit more of a combination of possibly place, but also tradition and and sort of a shared uh, history of winemaking and style of winemaking. All right, let's get to the wine. So I'll get into a little bit more what I'm drinking specifically here in a moment, but Chablis is kind of this interesting region and set of wines because there is a little bit of a bifurcation when you look at Chablis and the sort of uh, larger quantity of wine that's made that's labeled Chablis and then the Premier Cru and Grand Cru wines that are made in the region as well. That said, a couple of things that I think you can generalize about with most Chablis, the fruit profile that you would expect both on the nose and then on the palate is going to be a lot of things like tart green apple, green pear, lemon, you might get a little bit of a riper apple and pear characteristic at, if you are like me drinking a Premier Cru or Grand Cru wine. Those are from sites in the region that are a little bit warmer, produce a little more ripeness, and therefore you might get a little more of that generous tree fruit character, like I said, kind of riper apple and pear. But if you're looking at a, a sort of the standard bottling of Chablis or Petit Chablis, which is sort of another appellation that, that deals with some of the less, it's not that they're worse vineyard sites, but they're more kind of flat and um, as opposed to the sort of more preferent, the more preferred sloped um, vineyards, there you really will likely see that really tart fruit profile. You might also get notes of sort of an almond or hazelnut, um, especially if the wine has spent some amount of time um, being fermented or aged in um, neutral barrels that they'll often pick up a little of those sort of nutty tones. And then to me, the other two things, or three things I should say aromatically that I often find on Chablis so one of them is a pretty pronounced note of a sort of like flinty struck match kind of note when the wine has uh, been freshly opened. Um, it's more prevalent in really young wines. You see this a lot if you're drinking like a 2018 or, or even if you found a 2019, I'm not sure how much that is in the market right now. You might be more picking up those notes. And that is really a winemaking thing. It has to do with the use of sulfur in the winemaking process where, where it really kind of traps that smell and it usually dissipates pretty quickly. The other two that I often find are a little bit of a hint of, of a sort of Parmesan cheese that, that's not all that dissimilar from what you find with 
um, a lot of champagne and other sparkling wine, and it's the same root cause. The wine is often aged for some amount of time in contact with the lees or spent yeast, and that produces this sort of cheesy note. And with Chardonnay, I find in particular that the aroma comes through more cleanly uh, and more clearly on the nose than it does with some other wines that are aged on their lees for a long period of time, where that that aroma just comes across differently. And as a point of comparison, and not that we're talking about this wine today, but but if you compare that to Pinot Grigio, which is also often aged on the lees, there to me, the, the character of lees comes across more like, it's a little bit like, smells more like beer, like kind of yeasty in that regard. Whereas this, like I said, with, with a lot of Chablis, I get a little more of a cheesy note. And then the last thing that comes across sometimes in these wines is just a little bit of a sort of a mushroomy quality. I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's kind of a very, very sort of innocuous mushroom characteristic. It's often talked about in tasting as like a button mushroom or, you know, whatever cremini, you know, kind of the sort of cultivated mushroom, but it's not, um, but it's there. There's a little bit of that hint of just that kind of like, again, that sort of like mushroomy forest floor um, thing that is there on the nose. On the palate, like I said, you're likely going to get a similar fruit profile. And even on the wines where like the Premier and Grand Cru wines, where you might get more of that ripe fruit tone on the nose, often on the palate, that's more tart. Now, this wine is definitely like a lot of tart green apple, you know, Granny Smith. There's a little bit of like that kind of like green pear note. Um, and then and then a lot of lemon um, and, and lemon and lemon pith. And, and that conversation then uh, when we're talking about it, where there's that sort of tart citrus fruit and a little bit of bitterness often to me really recollects um, the idea of this sort of pith um, or even zest. But really, it's that pithy kind of, again, bitter character that, that comes through. The last thing to note, so I already mentioned tart a bunch. Obviously, these wines tend to be very high in acid. Uh, we'll get to the sort of benefits of that when we talk pairing a little bit later, but it's definitely uh, something that's that's a hallmark of Chablis, and as it should be. It's a very cool place, as we've talked about on a few previous um, live streams. Cooler uh, produ wine producing regions tend to make wines that are higher in acid. When you combine that with, as I mentioned, the sort of physiological fact that these grapes are grown in really kind of um, soils that are that are really really well suited to producing high acid grapes you're going to get a lot of that and then you know there's this other thing right that i talked about a minute ago this sense of chalkiness the sense of sometimes it's referred to as like sometimes there's like an oyster shell character um if those of you watching like me like raw oysters you know that kind of flavor you almost get that's distinct from the oyster flavor itself that sort of brininess but it's it's also that kind of like again that like calcium carbonate kind of thing. And it makes sense again, you know, this soil is made up of basically nothing but a bunch of old oyster shells. Um, and so I don't have an answer for you. I mean, I am not a scientist in that capacity. And the under, my understanding is that, you know, there's still a lot of ongoing work trying to explain why exactly do we get this impression of soil when everything we understand about the sort of biology of vines, it seems to indicate that that shouldn't be possible. We shouldn't be getting any dis we shouldn't be getting any sort of meaningful conveyance of the soil itself in the grape. I don't know. It's a mystery. It's part of what makes wine fun, I suppose. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about Chablis also in the context of um, the broader world of Chardonnay. I mentioned it at the top. I want to come back to it a little bit. So Chablis is going to be definitely on one sort of pole of the Chardonnay spectrum. We often think about Chablis in the wine world as being a sort of continuation of the broader appellation or region of Burgundy. And Burgundy is dominated by Chardonnay on the white side and Pinot Noir on the red side. And with uh, Burgundy, you're going to get a really different set of expressions of Chardonnay as you move from Chablis in the north through the sort of heart of the Appalachian or of the region in the Côte d'Or. And then as you move further south into the Côte Chalonnais and Maclonnais, which are warmer, you get a much riper style generally of Chardonnay. So here in the far north of the region, you definitely are going to see that most sort of tart citrus note compared to other white burgundy as you move further south. Uh, again, those will often show more of those generous apple tones. You might also get more oak usage in general in the winemaking, especially new oak with, with burgundy uh, from the Côte d'Or and even the Côte, uh, the Maconnet, it's become more commonly used there. Whereas in Chablis, you would rarely see new oak outside of Grand Cru and maybe some Premier Cru wines. Um, 
as it as far as it how it differs from a lot of like American classically American Chardonnay, Napa, or say Australian things like that, where you're dealing with a much warmer climate than Chablis, those wines will show much more fruit character. They'll probably show much more kind of tropical fruit character, things like pineapple and banana, um, that kind of really ripe, assertive tropical fruit. If they're showing citrus and apple or, or tree fruits, it's going to be really ripe, lush expressions of that. And those wines will often be aged in a lot. We'll see a lot of new oak, especially on the more expensive side. But even with the inexpensive side, it might not be barrels, but you might get oak chips or staves or things put in to, to bring out that oak character. And that's also going to lead you to these wines that have a sort of a buttery, creamy character to them as well. So part of the reason I love Chablis is because I think it does showcase a lot of what I love about Chardonnay without leaning on that really ripe kind of opulent style, which which has its time and place for sure. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that it's what I prefer to drink all the, all the time or even very often. Um, and I, I did want to mention too, sorry, I'm coming back to a, a point I was touching on a little earlier, and it, it comes back to this sort of co conversation about oak usage. So as I mentioned, Chablis kind of has four levels or four categories, Petit Chablis and Chablis, which almost never, you, you almost never see new oak. And in fact, in many cases, the wine is made in stainless steel to kind of heighten that sense of brightness and acid. And then at the Premier and Grand Cru level, where you're dealing with the sort of high, most highly regarded vineyards in the region, you will sometimes see some amount, even occasionally a, a pretty substantial amount of new oak on those wines. And actually to me, I, I, this is you know not always what everyone else agrees with. I sometimes find Grand Cru Chablis to be a little bit underwhelming, especially given the fact that it's relatively pricey and, and fairly rare. And often the reason for that is that it almost has too much oak. It, the wine, whereas a, a lot of use of a use of a lot of new oak on some Chardonnay, maybe from other parts of Burgundy, in some places in in the New World, it can kind of make sense to me. I think often with even the 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 ripest, warmest parts of Chablis, you tend to get a wine that when you then put in a lot of new oak, that's a little bit disjointed, and and that just kind of bums me out. That doesn't say there aren't great producers. There are some who use, I think, a judicious and, and sort of apt amount of new oak on their Grand Cru and, and Premier Cru wines. Um, and this is a producer I actually quite like. Um, it's a fifth generation, family owned, small producer. Um, and they own um, some, they make a, a fair bit of sort of just Chablis. And then they make this uh, one, this wine from a, a Premier Cru vineyard called Fourchamps, which is one of the, the most um, sort of generally highly regarded uh, Premier Cru vineyards. There are, I think, 40 of them in, in Chablis. And frankly, a lot of them are eh, whatever, but there are probably four or five that are highly, highly regarded in addition to the Grand Cru vineyards, which are really interesting. It's just kind of one big slope is the Grand Cru. It's really one Grand Cru is how it's really can, uh, technically organized in the French appellation system, but it has seven different named portions essentially that you could that you will often see on labels and um, not it's it's interesting they're 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 fun wines to try if you want something with a lot of prestige but isn't as crazy expensive as like Grand Cru Burgundy from other parts of Burgundy from further south where, where those wines can be hundreds or thousands of dollars a, a good expression of Grand Cru Chablis should probably be closer to like a hundred dollars not hundreds with some exceptions with the like really really top producers accepted um Another thing to note, you know, this this probably makes sense if you think about again what I said about how kind of cold and and really how kind of marginal Chablis is for wine production in general. It's definitely a, a place where understanding and knowing vintages does pay off a little bit. There are certainly lots of wine regions where the vintages are super consistent. Like when we get to our next uh, class on Wednesday with Red Mountain here in Washington, you're going to see, you know, I won't spend any real time talking about vintage because for the most part, they're pretty consistent. There, there's some variation, but but there's just less variation in terms and than there is in Chablis. And in Chablis, you unfortunately have some vintages that are just disasters. Um, 2016 is like the most obvious one where there were all kinds of issues with frost early in the growing season. There was hail late in the growing season. And a lot of producers made you know, like 10% of their normal amount of Chablis. Some made none um, in that vintage and, and many others made, you know, yeah, just 10, 15, 20%. So uh, that doesn't mean that if you see a 2016, it's not good. It's just, uh, in fact, it's often pretty good because it's what they were, it's the, what was left over that was, that was salvageable. But it is, it is a case where you're, you're going to see some variation and in the, and in the really cool vintages um, and really kind of challenging vintages, sometimes Chablis can be a little bit, 
you know, almost too hard and, and, and racy and, and acid driven and doesn't have the complexity that I do kind of prefer to find in there. Uh, I did want to mention too, uh, before I kind of get to the final part here with a little bit of thoughts about some pairings and, and whatnot, that if you do have any questions or anything, or if you want to share what you've been drinking, uh, please throw it in the comments now. Um, my other note real quick is um, if I assume, hope you all can see the comments I lifted beforehand, but if not, um, I will just run through real quick what we have coming up. So Wednesday we'll be doing um, Red Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon from Washington State. The, a week from today, uh, next Saturday, we'll be doing Vouvray. So coming back to France and looking at uh, Chenin Blanc from the Loire Valley. And then um, a week and a half, so uh, Wednesday the 29th, we'll finish up the initial sort of 12 class run with uh, Domaine Carnero Sprut. Um, but feel free to grab your favorite domestic or, or really any sparkling wine. It's going to be a little bit of a celebration um, and a little bit of a chat about bubbles. Again, we started there, we're going to end there. And then uh, if you have thoughts or suggestions on anything else that you would like me to cover going forward, I'd be happy to take those under advisement. Uh, I have some thoughts, but you know, if there's other wines or, or grapes or places that you're interested in learning more about, please let me know. Um, so yeah, so we'll wrap up talking a little bit about pairings here. Uh, so one of the things I love about Chablis is it's, it's unlike a lot of there's a lot of people are like, oh, you know, drink white wine with fish. And that's good advice if it's wine like this. I think actually there's a lot of whites that are not super fish friendly, uh, depending on the kind of fish. And, and especially like sort of your, your little bit more oilier or, or, or funkier white fishes can be actually a little overwhelming for some wines. But Chablis is, I mean, I think stands up really well to almost any kind of white fish. Uh, I'll be making fish and chips in a little bit here. And that's one of my favorite things to have with it. I mean, Chablis goes great with fried foods in general. Um, but, but whether it's, you know, baked, broiled, steamed or fried or however else you like to prepare your, your white fish, whether that's, you know, halibut, cod, sole, rockfish, whatever. It goes great with that. It's also really beautiful with shellfish. Uh, I mentioned oysters before. It goes great with raw oysters. It goes great with, you know, cooked clams, things like that. Um, you know, anything in, in certainly in a white wine or, or white wine and butter sauce goes really nicely. And then my other favorite pairing for this wine is actually, I think it's one of the, it's really, really delicious with uh, sort of softer, even kind of stinkier, more ripe cheeses. Uh, it's just, there's something about the, the, sort of brightness and that, that again, that sort of chalky character of the wine that really pairs nicely. It also does well with things that are like cheeses that are a little bit more on that chalky side, goat's milk cheeses and things like that. But, but I love it with just like a nice creamy brie or something like that. It's, it kind of cuts through the richness really beautifully and can also stand up to your, again, your more kind of funky plus, uh, and your delis de bourgogne's and things like that, that go really well uh, with this wine. Um, and yeah, so, that's kind of about all I've got. Uh, hopefully you are enjoying whatever Chablis you're drinking. Hopefully if you are a Chardonnay doubter, you are um, have been a little bit convinced by this to give it a try. And uh, and again, I think it's, Chablis is a great wine for for you to have in your kind of regular rotation with with your drinking because it's it's generally reasonably priced. You know, you can find pretty good Chablis for 20 ish dollars in a grocery store or, or wine shop or whatever. And uh, that's not something that you can say about a lot of other wines. And Chardonnay can definitely get pricey quickly if you're looking for quality. Um, it can also be pretty cheap if you're looking for not quality. And uh, so, yeah, so I think it's Chablis is a great wine to be aware of. It, it It's how always had a bad name because of some questionable labeling and sales and stuff like that. But it's a, a really um, a, a stalwart region that's got a lot of really, really talented and, and very dedicated producers. And uh, I encourage you to continue to explore it. So with that, I'm going to sign off. I'm going to keep drinking and start frying. And I uh, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. And I will see you back here on Wednesday for another edition of Disgorged Online.